This is a series of videos based on the book, Cases on Teaching Critical Thinking Through Visual Representation Strategies. Um, the authors, co-editors, are Lenny Chedletsky and Jeff Beaudry from the University of Southern Maine. Hi, this is Jeff Beaudry, and I'm here to introduce this video, which is going to focus on Confronting Critical Thinking Challenges in the Classroom by Chigazirum, uh, Utah, and Alexis Waters. Uh, both from the University of, University of Nebraska at Lincoln. One of the quotes that I like particularly is that mapping with teacher-facilitated discussion as learner-centered approaches emphasizes not only content but the context, purpose, and process of learning. As we go through the video, I want you to think of the questions that we have posed here on the screen, and we'll come back to those at the conclusion of the webinar. Uh, two of our authors from our uh, uh, book, uh, and they wrote a chapter called Confronting Critical Thinking Challenges in the College Classroom. And the emphasis is on the word in, and we'll find out more about that. Uh, and you're both are still at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, is that correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. Very good. Well, that's, that's wonderful. Um, and it's a delight to have you here. And I have uh, two visuals that I have. I have a, 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 a picture of the whiteboard, and I have this one. Which one would you like to start with? Um, we can start with this one currently, and we'll um, okay. and I'll let you know when to move to the um, whiteboard, maybe a little bit later. OK, very good. Well, then it's all yours. OK. Um, well, you know, this really, um, and again, um, the emphasis definitely is on in the classroom. Um, and sort of as we were working out, you know, our pedagogy and trying to figure out how we were going to approach teaching, I think we really began to notice that there were severe challenges um, in us even being able to get to the material because there were all these sort of critical thinking barriers. And we really began to think about with everything that an instructor has to do, with everything that a college educator has to do, how do we figure out sort of simple ways to engage uh, these critical thinking challenges? How can we create an environment for more meaningful learning? And so for me, really, it came with um, some failures in engaging students who were having those challenges and seeing some students fall through the cracks. And I narrate that um, in the beginning um, of, of the chapter as well and really understanding, coming to realization that this needed to be addressed in my everyday pedagogy. And Alexis can attest to that as well. Yes, so one of the things that I noticed and part of what I shared in my narrative at the start of the chapter was students were continuously coming to my office with questions about assignments, but they had no idea what specific question that they were coming to ask me about. They just seemed lost, kind of like, they knew what they wanted to say, but they didn't. They just couldn't connect the dots. And so what I found was that my students had trouble engaging in critical thinking. And because of this, they weren't able to come with specific questions. They weren't able to formulate specific arguments in their papers. And I was seeing this disconnect. And my passion is teaching. So part of my responsibility as a teacher to me is to be able to inform them and to be able to help them make these connections. And if I'm not able to make those connections or help them make those connections, then what part am I playing in their education and for their future? And so one of the things that I found was by getting into this study, um, what we did was we, we essentially found a way to help them engage in connections and critically think. So part of being able to critically think means to be able to make connections and to be able to formulate arguments about those connections. And one of the beautiful things was after, after they engaged in the concept mapping, they were able to make these connections. And so I think as instructors, we need to kind of be mindful about how we're helping students engage in interaction. So I'm going to let Chick Azirum kind of talk a little bit about meaningful learning, which was a, a huge section of our literature review. Right. So really um, uh, we were connecting, we connected three sort of bodies of literature, meaningful learning, learner-centered pedagogy, and critical thinking. And some people have already sort of been connecting the literature on, um, on uh, critical thinking and concept mapping, obviously. 
And just to summarize the basic tenets of those with learner-centered pedagogy, the idea is that you want to encourage students to take responsibility for their own learning. With meaningful learning, the basic tenet of that is that students need to be able to make links between past knowledge and current knowledge to meaningfully learn. So it's not just getting information and regurgitating that. Those links need to be made. With the critical thinking, one thing distinction that we made there was that not only are you trying to develop cognitive capabilities, such as interpretation, and analysis, evaluation, and inference, and those sort of things, but you also want to develop a disposition to critically think. And we really wanted this to be fun and engaging and get students excited about learning. But that being said, you can't just throw students into a new paradigm and just say, well, critically think or map this. I think instructors really need to facilitate this and guide students through it as they're learning how to take responsibility for their learning because as we also note, it's just as much of a paradigm shift for us as it is for the students, especially as we are products of sort of very lecture-centered um, models where you're just having information thrown at you. And so we really had to engage that paradigm shift. So. Um, Alexis is going to move on now to talking a little bit more about sort of our method and how we engage this specifically. So part of my favorite part about doing this pilot study was doing the methodology and actually bringing the concept maps to the classroom. That's really what we wanted to do. We, we noticed this disconnect in our students' education and we really wanted to see is this a tool that we can give them not only to use for themselves, um, in this course, but also to apply to other courses that they have currently and other courses they would have in the future. And our hope also is for them to be able to engage in critical thinking in the workplace as well and in their professional lives. And so one of the nice things about us was we had four classes the semester that we did this study, so we were able to test this in four different classes. They were pretty different demographics as far as students go. We had different majors, different levels of education. So we had a lot of diversity in the classroom, which really made this a beneficial piece of our paper. We also wanted to use this in a way that was going to be easy to implement. So we had basic steps that we used in order to have this implementation really smooth and transition in the classroom in a way that students would really understand what we were doing. So our steps were essentially, we started with an orientation phase. So we wanted a disposition to critically think and get students excited about learning about this tool and why this tool was important towards their education and helping engage them in the process of critical thinking. And that was part of what the orientation phase did. did. So it didn't require a whole motivational speech but it really was, we wanted them to visually see how they understood information. So that was part of what the orientation phase did. We kind of explained how to engage in the mapping process. And so, for example, um, just as Alexi said, you know, it's, it's not like giving them a whole spiel on the literature of critical thinking and concept mapping, but sometimes even instead of just jumping into it, something as simple as saying, you know what, you guys, so let, before we conclude today, I really want to see how you are understanding this information. So let's sort of look at this visually. Help me understand the links that you're making. You know, those sort of like prompts, I think, help them to sort of engage in the dialogue that we're trying to create. Right. And then we went on to our mapping. So we actually wanted to stimulate this cognitive dimension of critical thinking. And we had three simple levels that we used in order to help them map out their critical thinking. And Shigazira will talk a little bit about So those. as you can see, um, the example that we have on there is just really, um, this was in a class that was where they were preparing a speech. And so um, one of the things that, you know, again, one of the ways we see this critical thinking challenge come about is just sometimes students, even at the level of just organizing their speech, when they have a lot of information and they're like, well, I have to give a 10 minute speech. How do I put this together? This sort of helped us to um, model for them. OK, here's how you can think about what you're trying to do in an organized manner and piece everything together. And we gave them sort of um, these sample maps as an example, and then they were free to create um, their own. 
Um, and so here we had three main levels, main idea, sub idea, and support. And with this support, this is where we connect. Okay, what are you learning from the concept mapping? Draw in your prior experience. And um, some of my classes, I also even encourage them, draw in other things that you're learning from other classes that you're seeing as related. And, you know, I think one of the things that um, I can definitely appreciate with our discipline is the fact that we are becoming more interdisciplinary and it's important that students are not just making connections within our course material but that they're saying okay this is actually similar to what I just did in my philosophy class this is speaking to the same sort of idea and helping them to develop more of these um, expert learning behaviors where they are connecting the dots and so seeing the forest as opposed to individual trees is what we like to say and so in our classes, we will like to note this, is that it's not all hunky-dory. There are times where you have resistance because it's new. So it's just sort of like, oh, do we really have to do all of this? They're actually students who just want you to lecture them so that they can just sort of be there. And so in that sense, really that orientation phase and really making this relevant and guiding through and talking about why this is important, I think is cool. In my own class, um, what I found um, was especially useful is that when we did the concept mapping, in um, this, was a, this was a course that sort of was like an introductory course where we had to, um, where we had to uh, go through a lot of information, basic concepts that they would need moving forward in um, their degree. And so we had a lot of stuff to cover. And what I found was, number one, this really helped them to not only retain information, but to see the big picture. So it was no longer, oh, I know this definition, or I know this definition. It was, this is how they all fit within this larger area of intercultural communication, or this larger area of um, speaking this way or, or persuasive speaking or whatever that was so I found that to be very useful and Alexis will talk about some of the things she found as well yeah so in my class what I did was I had a map that I put on the whiteboard and you can show the whiteboard now because this would be in okay. Chigazirum's class would be the whiteboard um, but I did something very similar in my class I actually put the concept map on the whiteboard and I had them connect for themselves and so the class I was teaching, they were able to kind of see these connections a little bit more. Additionally, I had them for their paper map it out. It was part of the assignment. So I had them map out what they, what they, how they were going to do their paper. And they were to turn it into me, and I gave them feedback on each of their maps. A lot of them were really distraught about getting that map back because they said that that was how they were going to be able to articulate what their argument was in that paper. And so just the fact that my students really wanted that concept map back says something. Because a lot of times my students don't want anything back from me. They don't want to see their <laughs> grades. They don't want to deal with any of the ramifications of whatever I have to say. So what I found was they wanted these back. They wanted that because they were seeing connections visually. And that's what I think is so unique and so excellent about concept mapping is that they're able to visually see the connections. And they're able to, a lot of times I will have them even draw arrows to how things connect and explain those connections. So before when I saw that there were no transitions apparent in papers, transitions became apparent because they were connecting ideas to one another and you kind of saw this progression of critical thinking and it really was a, an outstanding experience to be able to see that my students were able to now make these connections and it was definitely a different demeanor for me as an instructor because I think we have to also think about how our students impact us and how we impact their learning so I view it as a very collaborative process and because it is a collaborative process the education process we also are able to see what we have done and what we can do better and how we can map out our own instruction. So even this concept mapping for me, I map out my lectures now and see the connections there. That way I'm able to help them map their, their own ideas out. And you know, this um, image, um, I included this on purpose because it's not the most perfect concept map. 
it shows that they're still learning how to do it. So one of the things that I, when they made this map, um, this map actually represents a map that was done at the end of, at the end of, towards the end of ending of the course. And I told them, hey, I want you to identify what you see as some key ideas or key themes and ideas and concepts that sort of run through the whole course. And I want to see the connection. Now, one of the parts I found that they were most resistant to was when you make arrows between the different areas and then put like a linking phrase, it was like, oh, can we just get past that? So usually after we would make this map, I would be like, okay, guys, I don't see any linking phrases. I don't see any linking arrows. Talk to me about how you see this linking. This is how you begin to, I think, really encourage them and facilitate that process. And honestly, just call them on the when they're being lazy about their thinking, right? And that's part of it. It's like, okay, come on, you guys, you can think about that a little bit more. What is the connection between cultural identity and racism and prejudice? Talk to me about what that means. What do you see there? And so this really, um, one of the biggest benefits we saw was that this helps us to identify gaps in learning, right? What are the gaps? And so if everyone's saying, well, I don't know, then okay, let's talk about that a little bit more. So this, um, I, I know another orientation we have towards education is also, um, it, is that education is a dialogic process. And that's one of those things that, you know, communication scholars, we throw around the word dialogic a lot. It, it's a cute word and we know it's a good thing and it's nice, but then when it actually comes to implementation, how does this happen? How do we make this dialogic? And this really, I think, was one of the ways we found that we could make our learning process more dialogic and sort of reframe information for students, not as this intimidating thing, but it's something that's interesting and that connects to everyday life and connects to their careers and connects to things that they're interested in. Um, another step that I've used during these concept maps, which is we, we have continued to use them um, in other courses as well, apart from the semester where we did this study, um, is that, you know, what some of the times what I will do is I will have students make this in groups. I love to do it with them in groups. Um, that's one of the ways that it moves faster within the classroom. But then I'll ask each group, okay, so each group, can you guys give me a one minute spiel? on what is going on here. Talk to me, give me sort of a mini sort of group presentation thing where you're telling me what's happening. Make sense for me verbally, connect the verbal to the visual. And sometimes they're like, oh gosh, really? I'm like, yes, I want to know what you, like I want you to also talk about this, right? So can you express this in an intelligent manner? So in conclusion, um, there are some things that we're, which, you know, we're going to just kind of like share some of our concluding thoughts. One of the cool things with this is that we see this obviously it's so interdisciplinary. It can be in implemented in so many different classes and so many different disciplines, and it really has applicability across the board. Mm -hmm. Um, I want to also note one more thing about the maps. We also, it's also a creative process. So I always tell my students, the map, no one, one map is going to look the same. Think of it as your treasure map, the treasure map of, of information. And I, I tell them that they can map it, which in whatever way makes most sense to them. So we provide them a baseline for what it looks like, but we don't necessarily tell them that this is how it has to be. Also, one of the things that I personally want to discuss is um, it does help us understand critical thinking, meaningful learning, and learner-centered pedagogy, um, and it's really underutilized. So we really need to have more research in these areas and engage literatures. And I actually am teaching online a lot lately, so being able to produce this same kind of idea on a, in an, on a technological format would really be beneficial in helping us kind of understand how this looks on technological, um, on online courses. I think that a lot of courses are moving towards online and so we need to kind of consider how that, would, how concept mapping would look for technology and then I'll let Jigazirum kind of finish up here. Um, in a more macro sense, you know, there is a lot of discussion among educators about how universities seem more and more removed from actually engaging students' minds 
not just stuffing them with information, but having this sort of intellectual growth where they are growing in terms of their critical thinking capabilities, where they're actually learning. And it's one thing to talk about it, but it's another thing to engage it. And obviously, there are a lot of politics and resistance involved sometimes. So we found that this is one of our ways to push back against what we see as this larger dynamic of such a lack of concern with really student learning. Then this can actually make learning fun. That was kind of a Sesame Street moment, but it, but it really is. It We've had some really enjoyable times in some of my classes, concept mapping, and just thinking through these things. And I love to hear their examples and their prior knowledge. And finally, we are planning to do a semester long um, study in the spring that's a bit more intense and where we're really looking at using concept mapping and some other tools that we've been developing in, in collaboration as well. And so we're really excited to see how this develops with the information that we currently have. Thank you so much. Yep, thank you. So here are the reflective questions for the video on critical thinking and mapping. What mapping strategies were used and why? There's always an important point at which teachers confront a new strategy. And Utah and Waters confronted this new strategy for a specific purpose. Next, how did the mapping strategies help students think critically about communication processes and multicultural beliefs? That gets to the content and the processes as well. And finally, Utah and Waters posed this question. What were the barriers to critical thinking and making connections? And how does mapping help teachers and students address and overcome these barriers? Again, this is Jeff Beaudry, and I would really like to thank um, Chigazirum Utah and Alexis Waters for presenting an in-depth look at their classroom and how they confronted critical thinking and how mapping became such an integral part of confronting these very difficult ideas, ideas that sometimes get passed over and, and are not appreciated. This is a video and a case study that appeared in Cases on Teaching Critical Thinking Through Visual Representation Strategies, which I co-edited with Lenny Shedletsky. This is Jeff Beaudry. Thank you.